Center Church. We are so excited that you're here to join us this morning. We are even more excited that we get to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that no matter where you're at right now, physically and spiritually and emotionally, he is with you. Whether you're in your living room, in your bedroom, in your backyard, or just watching anywhere you are at, he is with you. And that's the beauty of, of Jesus, the beauty of God. Father God, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you that your word is yes and amen, no matter where we're at, Father God. And that you just love us. That you're with us, Lord, no matter what we're going through in this place, in this time, in this season, Lord. But you have a bigger plan for us. We pray that you reveal those things to us, Lord, during this season. That we thank you, we worship you.
that you're holy, God. Holy in each one. An undivided God. And he asks us to be holy. So, Father, we thank you for your presence this morning. We thank you for the opportunity, the opportunity of God, to worship you. We give you great honor, praise, and glory, God, for your goodness. Because you are a good God. You are a wonderful God. And I know and I believe that I'm speaking for myself and I'm speaking for you this morning. I do believe, as one of our forefathers used to say, something good is about to happen to you. So welcome to Freedom Center Church. Amen? Hallelujah. Give God a praise. Hallelujah. presence. It almost makes you just want to stay in the place of worship. Uh, great job, guys. Amazing. We've been on the subject of train. Uh, not train as in a train, choo choo, but I'm talking about train. I think it is, it is very important. It is very important to live a life that's trained. Trained not for crisis only, but I think it's very evident that they're very important that we must be trained and ready for promotion. Amen. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, the Bible tells us to be ready in season and to be ready out of season. We must always be ready. Be ready when crisis happens and be ready when promotion is about to happen. We need to be ready. Readiness is very important. Readiness for somebody is for somebody that's expecting to be promoted. Readiness for somebody who knows I'm smart, I'm wise, and I'm going to protect my, my valuables. Amen? Hallelujah. Uh, the, in John 10.10, 10, Jesus himself says, uh, the, the devil comes to steal. He comes to kill, and he comes to destroy. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life, and I've come to give it to you more abundantly. Jesus did not come just to get us to heaven. It was Jesus who said, I've come not only to bring you to heaven, but I want you to have a life, a maximized life, an abundant life here on earth. It is God's desire that we live an abundant life here on earth. God sent Jesus so that you and I will not be in need, but for us to prosper when we're waiting to go home. Hallelujah. Amen. I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 9, verse 27. God wants us to maximize our lives. God desires for us to maximize our resources, maximize your, your life, maximize your, your, your potential, maximize your skills. It is very important to maximize this. God wants us to maximize because we understand and he understands that we were built with great potential. Amen? In verse 27, in the NIV today, I'm going to read out of the NIV. It says, as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said, Yes, Lord, they, they replied. Then he touched their eyes, and he said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. And Jesus warned them sternly that no one knows about this. Like I said before, it is God's desire that we learn how to steward. But it is God's desire that we maximize our resources. That we live to our highest potential. But mainly God wants us to maximize our skills Amen. and our talent. When we fail to maximize what God has given us, then we're saying, then we're basically saying, God, you should not give, it, you should not give me that potential. You should give it to somebody else. When we fail to maximize and steward our resources, our lives, and our, and our possessions, we're really saying, I don't want to live to the highest Come potential. On. I don't want to live to the potential that God created me to live. Hallelujah. You and I have untapped potential. Amen. You and I have untapped potential. You have potential in you that you haven't even discovered yet. Good. We have what is called redemptive potential. What is redemptive potential? I'm so glad you're asking me this morning. Amen. 
redemptive potential is, is, is when Christ, Christ, because of Christ, he, he, he redeemed us from the hand of Satan and put us into the hand of God. And because we are redeemed, now we can do things we could not do before. Now we can have things we never thought we could go before. Your potential, your highest, your most maximized potential is very important. Listen to me. Because your potential is what causes your purpose to happen. Good. Your purpose is an answer to a situation in your life or an answer to a situation in somebody else's life. If you're not being an answer to anything, you're not living to your highest maximized potential. God wants us to be good stores, stewards of our lives, our possessions, and our skills. But why? Because what separates extraordinary from ordinary? What it is what separates extraordinary from ordinary, and I can sum it in one word. Potential is defined by, by, by courage. Having courage. Because the people, let me tell you something about your potential. Let me tell you something about your resources. Sometimes you don't have to have resources. Sometimes maybe you don't even see yourself as great potential. But I got news for you that in the Bible, it, it, it shows that the people that did great exploits for God, weren't even have, they didn't even have the right resources. They didn't even have the resources. They didn't even have experience. But one thing they did have was they were courageous. Courageous. People that have great potential are always courageous. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, in Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, God tells, God tells Joshua, I want you to be successful. I want you to have that abundant life, Joshua. But you've got to have to understand that in verse 9 it says, I want you to meditate upon my word day and night. Day and night. Because if you want an abundant life, you've got to meditate on my word day and night. And then he tells them, be strong. Be courageous. Be strong and be courageous and do not be afraid. He said, be courageous. God was not telling Joshua, be more anointed. God was not telling Joshua, be gifted. No, because Joshua was already anointed. Joshua was already gifted. You are already anointed. You are already gifted. And that's all you need to know. But see, Joshua was about to step in some, into some very big shoes. He was about to take over Moses' ministry. And the people of God were so used to accustomed to Moses. The way Moses preached, the way Moses handled the situation, there were accustomed voices, uh, uh, Moses' uh, voice. But Joshua was wildly different. Joshua was different from Moses. You know why? Because God does not make duplicates. Somebody out there looks just like you. But nobody can be you. Mm. Come on. Somebody out there looks just like you, but nobody can be you. My Bible tells me you are fearfully and you are wonderfully made. Come on. You are above everything else. God created you with a purpose in your life. There's absolutely no, nowhere in the Bible where God never said everybody that was born was born without a purpose. Amen. Or that God would say everyone that was born was born without potential. Or that everyone that was born, and when Jesus said, I want you to have life. I have them more abundantly. Jesus was not speaking to a specific, specific group. Jesus was actually talking to everybody. Everybody. I don't care what situation you're in. I don't care what you're facing. I don't care if you're in a wheelchair. I don't care if you're in a bed in a hospital. I don't know if you don't have the resources. I don't know why you were born or, or what you have or don't have. But when Jesus said, I want you to have life and have it more abundantly, he was talking to everybody. He was talking to everybody. David. David defeated Goliath. It was not because he had experience in military. As a matter of fact, David was, 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 is known for a song. He loved to make songs. He loved to write songs. He was a great worshiper. But David didn't defeat Goliath because he knew how to worship or because he knew how to write songs or because he had techniques. He it was in the military. David had one thing that nobody had. In all the land, what David had was courage. David was courageous. He was not afraid. He was not afraid. He had faith. As a matter of fact, the, the, most, the best example that I can, I can share with you that as far as courage is concerned is Jesus. Jesus on the cross. I don't think that he was, he, he was uh, uh, nailed to the cross because he loved only. Yes, it was love. But I think also he wanted to show us what courage was all about. 
Jesus was convinced that God the Father was going to raise him up from the dead. He was so convinced that God would raise him up from the dead that he said, I'm, I'm willing to go on, on, to, on the cross. I'm willing to be nailed because I trust God. And let me tell you what courage is all about. Courage is nothing more than one word, faith. Jesus had faith in his daddy. He had faith in God. He said, because I have faith in my father that if I give my life away, my God is going to bring me back again. That's what you call courage. Courage is faith. Faith. And the Bible said faith without works is what? It's dead. And works without faith is also dead. And if we're ever going to accomplish anything, you need, I'm going to tell you this morning, you need to be courageous. If we're ever going to accomplish anything, you need to have be courageous. Because you can have all the gifts in the world. You can have all the resources in the world. You can have all the talents in the world. But if you don't have courage... It is as if you had nothing. And Jesus was the best example. We, we often, uh, when we hear somebody preach or talk about Jesus, we often, everybody tells, tells us or preaches about to be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. Love like Jesus, guys. You know what I mean? Uh, be caring like Jesus. Be like Jesus. Preach the gospel like Jesus. But very rarely does anybody ever tell you to have faith like Jesus. Very rarely does anybody tell you to have faith like Jesus. And Jesus was one, 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 one son, one, one God that knew how to model what it was, to model what was faith and what was courage. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you something today. That what, what everything that moved Jesus, what moved Jesus was actually faith and courage. That was the only thing that moved Jesus was people that had faith and courage. And in, in Matthew chapter 9 verse 27 it's very confusing if you read the first, the first verse. It says that blind man followed Jesus. Blind man followed Jesus. Are you confused yet? I said blind man were following Jesus. How? How can blind man follow Jesus? And let alone they follow him into a house. A blind man are following Jesus. They're following Jesus, but how are they following Jesus? I don't know. But to me, that was an evidence of somebody who had an attitude of faith and courage. Good. It was an evidence, an attitude of people that were of great achievers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Woo. Good. Go Hallelujah. I was reading up. And I'm looking up the name because it's, I want you to, the name, learn helplessness. I was looking it up, and I'm, and I'm reading about these blind men that are following Jesus, and psychologists, uh, because if you, if these blind men had every reason to stay stuck. They had every reason to stay, st stay stuck at home and say, you know what, I, I need to be in the street corner, I need to be a beggar, I, I can't do anything, I can't accomplish anything. They had every reason, but these blind men are what you call people of faith and an attitude of a great achiever. Psychologists call people that make excuses why they can't accomplish anything. It's called is learned helplessness. Learn helpless is the people that make up a story because their inability, because they got something, one thing wrong with them, and they know they 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 use this an excuse for why I cannot make it in life, why I I I can't accomplish much things in life because they look at this one thing, this one thing, but but you know it's 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 not it's not the inability, but it's the creativity that makes a person do something great in life. It's not the, the small thing that's wrong with you, but it is, it is what is working with you. Hallelujah. Faith makes people creative. And I think these blind men were creative how they follow Jesus. Faith makes you operate no matter what. Faith causes you to do things no matter what. Jesus was very creative with his faith. Very creative. When Jesus, Jesus used his finger to write on the ground. Jesus used his finger to put him in the ear of some, somebody who was deaf. And their deafness, their, 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 their hearing was restored. Jesus spit in the ground and he made mud and put it on the blind eyes of a person and his blind eyes were restored. Jesus would speak to dead things and they would come back to life. That's what Jesus, Jesus was very creative with his faith. And these blind men happened to be very creative with their faith. They said, man, my eyes are not working. They said, my eyes are not working, but... My mom does. My eyes are not working, but my ears do. My eyes are not working, but my hands work. My eyes are not working, but my 
feet are working. They followed him because they didn't focus on that one thing. They saw the main things that were still working in their life, and they used that to maximize their life. They became creative. Listen to me. I don't know what's that one thing that's holding you back. But if you stop and just count to all the good things that are actually working for you, you can be like these two blind men, and you can be creative with your faith and get things done, things you never thought you could get done. Are y'all with me? Yeah. And then I, we read about that they, they're following Jesus. They followed Jesus, but on the way to follow Jesus, outside they call him Son of David. And it amazes me because you've got two blind men following Jesus. This amazes me because I, I'm, I'm very visual. I'm very visual when I read something. I'm I, I create my own story, and I, was, I, I think I'm going to make a good producer or, or something like that of a movie, because when I read something, I'm very visual. If you tell me a story about something that happened to you, I'm more than likely, I'm not going to see it the way it happened to you, because I'm very visual. But I'm seeing these two blind men. They're following Jesus, and they're saying, Son of David. Son of David. And it, it, was, it was a customary that when people saw would see Jesus, they would call him Son of David because of the prophetic prophecy that God had prophesied that from David and Jesse would come in the lineage, in the line, uh, would come a, a, a savior, a, 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 a savior that would, would reign as king. That, but I, I think, I think these blind men, because they can't see. But in essence, they're saying, I, I see something in you, Jesus, that's different from everybody else. And this is in, inside, because you don't have to, you don't have to have physical eyes to, to envision things. You can envision things with your eyes closed. And they must have heard about him. And, and in essence, they, were, they had a vision that Jesus was not like everybody else. Pretty much, don't let this blind eyes fool you because I can see you. Pretty much, don't let this eye blind eyes see you because I can see more of you than you think I can see. Hallelujah. When I, when we can see who you really are. We can see that you really are. But the way you talk, but the way you speak, you must really be the son of God. You must be, really be the next king that's in line. The way you talk, we see something in you, Jesus, that not everybody can see. Hallelujah. And, and, and oh, wow. Faith lets you see things that other people see, but you see it different. They saw Jesus. They saw something about Jesus that was different. Thank you for my water. They saw something about Jesus that was different. Listen to me. I'm going to tell you something. I was, reading, I was reading the other day, it says that however you behold God, makes him behave towards you. Yeah. Whatever you perceive, you receive. You can never get something right if you're always seeing something wrong. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. And in Mark chapter 6, this is a, a great example. Is Jesus is going to his hometown. He's going to go visit his cousins, his primos, his aunts, the relatives and the people he grew up with. Jesus is going to his hometown because Jesus wants his hometown to get what he's got. Mm -hmm. Jesus wanted everybody to have salvation, to know who he was. He wanted everybody to be healed. But the Bible said that he could not heal many. It doesn't say he could not heal any, but he could not heal many. So Jesus is in his hometown. And they saw this as well. This is, this is the carpenter's son. I know he was. I, I know this guy. I know this person. I, I saw him grow up. I know his parents. I know them all. And this is the thing. That if you see a carpenter, you can get your house fixed. But if you see a Christ, you can get your life fixed. Because whatever you see is what you're going to get. Whatever you see is what you got. Whatever you perceive is what you receive. Come on. It's what you see is what you get. Yes. But my Bible tells me in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 that my God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above more than you can ever ask or even think of. But it says, according to the power of that is a work inside of you. If you serve a big God, if you see a big God, give him a praise. Whatever you see is what you get. Hallelujah. And the enemy wants you to see him wrong. He wants nothing more than for you to see God wrong. Because if you can see him wrong, your life will be wrong. Hallelujah. 
And Jesus responds, I like the response of Jesus says, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Do you believe that I'm able to do this? And to me, God was saying to me that when Jesus asked this question, because a question is a form of faith. By the time God asks you a question, he would, it's not for him to know, it's for you to know. Yeah. And he says, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yeah. In other words, are you following me because you're desperate? Mm -hmm. Or are you following me because you have faith? Oh, come on. Do you believe, listen to me, that I'm able to do this? Everybody say this. Yes. The same question that God asked Abraham. Abraham and God are having a conversation one time. I wasn't there, but I read about it. And they're having a conversation. And God is telling Abraham, Abraham, Sarah's going to have a baby. And Sarah was eavesdropping in the conversation. In Spanish, we call it orijando. She was orijando. She was eavesdropping in the conversation that Abraham and God were having. And God heard her laugh when God had said that she was going to have a baby. And God turns his attention toward Abraham and tells Abraham, Abraham, is there anything too hard for God? Mm -hmm. And Jesus is saying, do you believe that I'm able to do this? The fact is this, I know you believe I'm the son of God. I know you believe that I parted the Red Sea. I know you've heard about me that I raised the dead. I know you heard about me that I fed 4,000. I know you believe you heard about me that I fed 5,000. I know you heard about me that I ministered to a woman who was caught in adultery. I know, but no, 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 no. I know you know about that, and I know you believe that, but this situation you're going through, do you believe that I can do this right here? Not can it be done, but do you believe this can be done? Hallelujah. And then they said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I was reading it this morning, and it just almost just, my shoes almost flew off my legs. It was like, he said, yes, Lord. And if you read this, when they're following Jesus outside, they're calling him son of David. When they get with Jesus inside, they're calling him Lord. And I asked the Lord, he says, why did they call you son of David outside and Lord inside? He says, because the closer you get to me, the more you know who I am. The closer you get to me, you will know who he is. The closer you get to God, he's no longer a son of God, but your, your Lord. The closer you get to God, you get to see a healer. The closer you get to God, you get to see a deliverer. The closer you get to God, you say you, you see an, open, an open, open door no man can shut. The closer you get to God, you see a shut door that no man can open. The closer you get to God, you get to see a miracle. The closer you get to God, get to God, you get off your sick bed. The closer you get to God, you get to, no matter what may you may believe in, the closer you get to God, you'll always, come, you'll always call him something different. Even Abraham called him Jehovah. But when he got close to God and God provided for him a lamb, he changed his status. He said, oh, you got so close to me, I can see your Jehovah, Jireh, you're my provider, hallelujah. Because the closer you get to God, and they say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Why? Because I'm so close to you, I know that you're the one who created my eyes. I'm so close to you that I'm going to let you be Lord over my eyes, be Lord over my situation. Be Lord over me. Be Lord over me. And then Jesus said, well, let it be. Repeat after me. Say, let it be. Let it be. According, to your According to your faith. Not according to my power. But let it be according to your faith. In other words, this is scary. Because <laughs> you're standing in front of Jesus. And then Jesus looks at you. You're asking Jesus for something. And he says, let it be according to your faith. In other words, Jesus is basically saying, said, if it were not for your faith, you would not get your sight back. Mm -hmm. if, if it's not for your faith, no matter how powerful I am, no matter how great of a God I am, my preference is that I want you to be healed. My preference is I want you to be restored. My preference is, my preference is I want you to rise up. My preference is I want you to make it. My preference, I want you to be, be debt free. But he says, it's all according to your faith. Yeah. But my preference requires participation. Yeah. You got to know, do you really want it? Yeah. Wow. Because it's always according to your faith. Yeah. 
It's not according to God's power. It's according to our faith. Because God can have all the power yes. and everything we'll ever need. Yes. According to your faith, your participation. Amen. I'm about to close. Because there's no, there's no excuse. If God says, I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly, then he means it. And you come to give you something, it's because it's available. And if it's available, it's because it's yours. We, we can't be like what psychologists say. Learn helplessness. That we look at the one thing that's wrong with ourselves. And we give ourselves every reason why we can't accomplish anything in life. And the story about this blind man is it's amazing. These guys are blind. They're blind. And they have every reason, more than you and me. More than you and me to, to a reason to stay stuck on the side of the road and say, you know what, I'm going to be a beggar. You know, I'm, 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 that's it, that's it. I'm going to stay right here. I've learned how to look at my bad things and allow them to be my handicap. Allow them to hold me back. But watch. According to the writer. Matthew. He says their eyes were restored. Everybody say restored. Restored. That gives me a reason to believe that there was one time when they could see. And they lost their sight. Because life can steal your sight. Maybe you're not, you, you don't need a touch because you got physical blindness. But maybe you lost, you lost sight in your heart. Because your eyes give you sight to see. But the eyes of your heart give you vision. Vision for your purpose. Vision for your family. Vision for your life. Vision. And you lost this vision. Your focus is gone. Because life can take away your sight. And you know, I minister to a lot of people. And maybe somewhere in the past you went through something. You lost somebody. Something happened to you. Your life was hit by something. A storm that came. And you are disappointed because disappointment, let me tell you something this morning. Disappointment is nothing but a thief. When you get disappointed, disappointment steals from you because the devil comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And he wants you to be disappointed. He wants you to miss out. He wants you to lose. But you know what? No greater see that is inside of you than he's in the world. And because you've been disappointed and the thief is taken away from you. You decided to, I'm going to, this is the way I am. This is the way I'm going to stay. So I'm going to close the door to my dreams. And I know that you are listening to me this morning. Because I do know you believe in God. I know you believe in God. But maybe your faith is not where, like, you, you can actually step out of the boat and walk on water. Like, like Peter, your faith is not there. But God wants to restore your vision. God wants to give you sight again because the devil wants to sabotage your life more than anything. You're powerful. And the devil knows that. And sometimes more than we know that. If you don't believe me, read the story of Jesus in Luke chapter 1 and chapter 2. The moment that Jesus was born, the devil put it into Herod's heart to kill every baby. I'm getting emotional because that Herod knew that if this little baby boy was to grow up, that he was going to destroy his kingdom and remove him from office. Herod knew that if this baby made it, the devil showed Herod the potential that was inside of Jesus. And Herod was willing to kill every baby in the land just to get to that one potential person. And God created all of us with great potential. And the enemy is out there to slaughter, to destroy, to, to take away everything that God has given you. And the devil will use one disappointment to steal it from you. 
And God this morning wants to restore your sight. He wants you to see again with the eyes of your heart and see with vision. Vision, you do have a purpose. You do have a calling in this world. And God wants to heal your heart and open your blind eyes and let you know there's more before you than what is against you this morning. More for you than what is against you. And some of us, the enemy started very early in our age, like me. And some of us, maybe it was yesterday. Maybe it was yesterday, I don't know. But you say to me, Pastor, I do believe in Jesus. I do believe in God, but not to the point that I can step out of my boat and walk on water. I know where that comes from. I know where that comes from. I was there. I was there. It's hard. It's a hard place to be because that disappointment is a thief. It's a thief. But this morning, he's been exposed. This morning, you have an opportunity to get your life back. And wherever you're at, and I want everybody to pray with me here this morning, but wherever you're at this morning, I want to pray that God will open the eyes of your heart. And if something you're going through is physical, I want you to meet Jesus and I want you to get so close to him that you finally realize that he is Lord. He is Lord over your whole body. He is Lord over that gun that was about to pull the trigger. He's Lord over drugs. He breaks them. He's Lord. But get close and you see that. I want to pray for you. Let's pray. Close your eyes wherever you are. Close your eyes. It's a good day. It's good news for you. You have a purpose and your potential. Maximize your life. So Heavenly Father, I thank you, God. I thank you, Lord God, for the people that are watching me this morning. God. And I don't know what situation they're in, and it doesn't matter who they are what place they find themselves in, God. They can be a president. They can be a congressman. It can be a, a lawyer. It can be a governor. It can be a, a, a business owner. It can be a, a, a dad who lost his wife or a wife who lost her husband. It can be somebody going through a divorce or marriage. Or it can be a child that's lost out there. And you lost hope. You stopped praying. You close the door. And Father, I'm praying. I'm praying, God. That there's no distance between us and them, God, between you and them especially. That you would touch their hearts right now, God. And open the eyes of the heart. Let them see, God. And that they rise up, Lord God, and they get a piece of paper and a pen and start writing down everything that does work. And scratch off everything that don't work, but become creative with their, with their, with their faith, God. Because it's true. We can do all things that you give us true. And thank you for healed hearts this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you something this morning. Now, I don't know if you know Jesus. You know, I was reminded this morning, I was talking to my cousin. And I, I, was, I was really young. Before that, right after the VBS thing. And her name is Marina. I was really young. I was already into drugs and stuff like that. But I, I, I just happened to be at her house. But watch. The power of, of a word. Power of a word that, of a testimony. And I just happened to stop at her house and she tells me a testimony of what Jesus has done in her life. I didn't even know who Jesus was. And I told her, I said, well, I didn't even know why you told me. What was the point? But for whatever reason, it stayed with me. It stayed with me for some reason or another, no matter how messed up I was, no matter how situation I found myself in no matter what but little glimpses of Jesus everywhere in my life wherever I stepped this this held on to me gave me the power that whatever was, was trying to destroy me it was almost God reminding me you're my son you're my son you're my son even without knowing who God was and I forever thank God for the people that were sent my way to touch me in such a way and give me sight to see until the day I received Jesus Christ 
And the moment I sipped it into my heart, it's almost like I saw things I could never see. I'd never seen before. He opened my eyes and let me, he showed me something, showed me that, hey, I'm important. Hey, I matter. I don't have to be important to everybody, but I'm important to him. I know he loves me so much that he put up with me and he sold up. My God loves me. Loves me so much that he's never given up on me and he will never give up on me. And I can forever be grateful to that. I don't walk on water, but I walk with him. Have you never accepted Jesus Christ? I invite you this, this morning. Right there, right where you're at. We can all pray together with you. I might ask a few people that are here to pray with us. So I want you to just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe you were born from a virgin. I believe that you died, that you were buried, and that you rose again. And this morning, Jesus, I confess you with my mouth, and I believe in you with my heart. I invite you to be my Savior, to come into my heart and be my Savior. And I also invite you to be my Lord. I thank you for my salvation. I thank you that your word says, old things have passed away. Behold, old things have become new. I will move forward to the life you already purposed and prepared for me. I thank you that I am a new creation in Christ. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And we say, Amen. I have my beautiful wife. I have some words from announcement for you. I hope you were blessed. I know I was blessed. Listen to me. When I say I love you, we really love you. We really mean it when we love you. And uh, have a great day. Uh, honey? Good morning. How is everybody doing today? What an amazing word that we had this morning. Really life-changing, really impactful. And we're so excited that you were able to join us this morning as we worship God together and as we receive from his word today that was so impactful. Now, we want to give you the opportunity to give this morning. And you might ask yourself, and, you know, uh, and I'm going to be very transparent with you, that we've been hearing out there on social media people making fun of churches when they ask for the tithes and offerings. Let me tell you, Freedom Center Church, where your tithes and offerings go, they go for the rent, they go for the light, they go for the water, they go for the bills before anything else. And what we want is that we want your church to be here when we come back, amen? When, we're, when they say, you know what? Shelter in place has been lifted. Go to your house of worship. We want Freedom Center Church to be yeah, full functioning, yeah, yeah, full yeah, going, yeah. ready to go for you, amen? So you have two ways that you can give. You can give through PayPal and you can go to our website, which is freedomcenterchurch.org. And you can go in there and click and you give through PayPal. Or now we have the Givelify app. So you can download the app, put in your information, make Freedom Center Church your house of worship, and you can give through there. And let me get, let me tell you that what you give, amen, is not only going to impact the RGV, but it's going to impact the nations, amen? Freedom Center Church Africa, Liberia, um, Freedom Center Church Uganda, you know, and all those places that God is calling us to be at, Amen. So let's pray for your giving. Father, I just thank you, Lord God, for the giving of the tithes and offerings this morning. We thank you, Father, that we will be faithful stewards of your word. What is giving into this ministry, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, we dedicate it to you. What is given into this ministry, Father God, in the name of Jesus, will go so that the house of God and the people of God, Father God, can go forth in power and might to take your word unto the nations, unto our neighborhoods, unto the, uh, unto the foundations of the earth, Father. And we thank you, Lord God, for this day today that you have given us. I thank you for every viewer. I thank you right now in the name of Jesus that we release blessing upon their lives in the name of Jesus. I thank you right now, Father, in Jesus' name, that as stewards of this house, Father God, as the priests of this home, Father, we call them blessed, Father. We call them blessed going in, and we call them blessed coming out. We thank you that they are the head and not the tail. They are above and not beneath, Father, and they will have favor with God and with man wherever they go. We bless you. You can follow us on social media, on Facebook Live. We'll be here on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We also have a Twitter. We have an Instagram. And we go live on Periscope um, every Sunday morning as well. But you can go back 
after service. And if you want to hear this again, I know I want to hear it again. I want to take notes. So you go to YouTube and we'll, we'll put it shortly on YouTube and you can follow us on that. So we love you. Be blessed. We'll see you Wednesday at seven o'clock.